They've been called real tough hombres, ultimate badasses packing state-of-the-art firepower with nothing they can't handle. The marines that would be accompanied to LV-426 with Ripley to investigate the loss of communications with the colony had apparently already seen it all. And in a line that sparked years of theories about their past missions, it's asked if the LV-426 mission would be a stand-up fight or another bug hunt. Have the marines seen an aliens encountered extraterrestrial beings before? Other bugs they had to snuff out. Their past missions have been alluded to in previous Extended Universe material, though quite appropriately the short story collection Aliens Bug Hunt shares some history amongst the group, including the ultimate badasses having to take down hostile life forms on a dangerous mission overseen by Wayland yutani In Blowback by Christopher Golden, Sergeant Apone led his squad under the supervision of Wayland yutani appointed CEO Emma Polson to the Pollux system on a highly sensitive and of course classified mission which the Marines believed to be a bug hunt. Bug hunters for this op included Apone, Dietrich, Spunkmeyer, Hicks, Hudson, Vasquez, Wierzbowski, Crow, and previously unseen members, Kahn, Zeller, Stenbeck, and a green new Marine by the age of 18, Private Malinka. Much of the interactions in the story play off the relationships we already know, but offering a few glimpses into the characters we haven't quite seen. For example, the story explains that Vasquez viewed Apone as something of a father figure, which wasn't exactly a good thing. Blowback describes an exchange between the two. Vasquez, I'm already bored with this op. Can we just go out and kill whatever we're supposed to kill? Get this bug hunt over with? Apone, belay that shit, Vasquez. We're gonna set a good example for our greenie today. Private Malinka needs to see how this unit operates so she can learn how you've all survived together this long. Which means you and Hudson and Wierzbowski and Stenbeck are on notice right now, before we even hit the surface. We do this quick and by the book. Is that clear? Vasquez. I hear your voice in my sleep, Sarge. Apone. What's that? Vasquez. I said yes, sir, Sergeant, sir. Apone. Damn right you did. Vasquez and Dietrich exchanged a knowing look. Half the time Vasquez only said the things she did in order to get a rise out of Sergeant Apone. The man wasn't much older than herself, but he had a grizzled air about him, partly due to the bushy black mustache he always seemed to be smoothing down. That made him seem like everybody's disapproving father. Dietrich knew from late night conversation that Vasquez didn't have a high opinion of fathers and couldn't resist pushing Apone's buttons. In the story, there is also a focus brought to Dietrich and her fraternizing with fellow Marine Corporal Tim Stenbeck. The two had been sleeping together on and off, but things seemed to cool down until the night before the mission, where the two drank whiskey, spent the night together, and were left fighting hangovers during the briefing. The marines were landing on Clyde Menestra, a moon orbiting Theseus in the Pollux system. The marines weren't there for research. Two research teams had already spent time on the moon, in fact, and were killed. The marines were there to make sure the third team of scientists Wayland yutani planned to send might have some time to build themselves a compound before the local fauna whatever the hell these aliens might be, could turn them into chum. Lieutenant Polson explained the mission. The company's exploration drones found an element on this moon that will revolutionize interstellar travel. They've been working for decades on better engines, better fuel. Eleven years ago, they theorized that a combination of two elements, let's forget the chemistry and just call them salt and pepper, could do so. The problem is that every time the researchers tried to combine salt and pepper, they blew up their lab. What they needed was some third element that would stabilize that mixture. From the reports I've read, they've tried over 2,000 combinations before they gave up a few years ago. But 11 months ago, Wayland yutani drones found a gas in the atmosphere of this moon that they are certain will render those combustible elements inert. If they're right, they think they'll have a fuel that will allow spacecraft to be re-engineered, to travel many times faster than they ever have, before the amalgam of those elements would have just exploded, killing everyone on board. But now, if they can draw it from the atmosphere of Clytemnestra, well, you can imagine. Hicks cleared his throat. Thanks, lieutenants. I think we've got the rest. The usual, Hudson agreed. Put our asses in the shredder. Don't be such a pussy, Hudson, Vasquez said. You gotta think long term, Hermano. They put two science teams down on this damn plateau and bugs killed them all. So they call the exterminators. That's us. Killing bugs is just good exercise, man. And what do we get out of it? Wierzbeski muttered. Sergeant Apone glared at him. For starters, you don't get court-martialed. Dietrich breathed. Her nausea had all but vanished. I'll tell you what you get, Wierzbowski, she said. Less time drifting around deep space, waiting for some action. Even Hicks smiled at that. 
On the surface of the planet, the mission began, and the bug hunt very quickly became an intense fight for life. Zeller. I've got movement. Rysbowski. I see nothing. Not a blip on this thing. Zeller. I've got multiples now. Northwest. Coming our way. Apone. Up high? You saying these things are flying? Dietrich saw it then, slicing through the air. Just a glimpse of it, thin and wraith-like, body open to catch the wind as it glided toward her. She muttered a stream of profanity into her comm unit and pulled the trigger, firing a plasma burst that lit up the dust storm like lightning high up in a thunderstorm. The thing banked left somehow made itself smaller, then plummeted down toward the ground, headed for her face. She dropped, rolled right, came up onto one knee with her weapon aimed at the spot where the thing had alighted. It stood six feet away and for a few heartbeats they were eye to eye. Dietrich and this creature unlike anything she'd ever seen before. Despite what she'd seen over her, the bug stood tall and thin, its limbs like razors, its body seemed smooth and black, glassy as volcanic rock. She counted two sets of eyes, both covered by a gossamer membrane which seemed to screen out the dust and grit of the atmosphere. Gunfire punched the air around her, Zeller shouted about incoming bugs, whereas Bowski kept insisting he didn't see anything on his sensor. As Dietrich pulled the trigger, the wind roared across the plateau and nudged her to the left, throwing her off aim. Plasma burst tore up the rocky ground near the bug and it shot her a look that might have been nothing more than curiosity. Then it opened like a flag unfurling. The wind took it, blew it backward and upward, and it angled its body so that it was soaring high out of range in the space between one breath and another. Dietrich. Holy shit. Stenbeck. Cynthia. Dietrich. I'm fine. Stenbeck. You can't hesitate like that. Could have gotten yourself... Hudson. Can you two hump each other later? Like, after we kill all these damn locusts, or whatever they are? There was more shouting, more weapons fire, more shapes knifing through the Atmo storm. Spowski complained again about his sensor until Spunkmeyer finally slapped it out of his hand. Spunkmeyer. It's broken, idiots. Use your goddamn eyes instead. Vasquez. Shit, Bowski. You know you must be stupid when Spunkmeyer's got to explain stuff to you. Apon. Fix that scanner, Hicks. Zeller. Incoming. Stenbeck. Get up. Incoming, dammit. Get on your feet. Dietrich and Hudson rose in the same moment, both of them staring as Stenbeck raced toward them. He lifted his plasma rifle and fired above them, but Dietrich's focus stayed on the pair of bugs slicing through the dust storm, gliding down behind Stenbeck. By the time she raised her plasma rifle, they were too slow for her to take the shot without hitting Stenbeck. Down, Hudson said, taking aim. Steny, hit the dirt. Even from thirty feet away, through the dust, Stenbeck's moment of epiphany showed in his eyes. He dove to the rocky ground, rolled, propped himself onto his elbows too late. The things were almost on him. Dietrich and Hudson started to fire. A figure came out of nowhere, emerging from the dust to the east. Only when she started shouting and cursing did Dietrich recognize Private Malinka's voice. On the range, Malinka had no peer. Eighteen years old, but she could shoot the whiskers off a cat from a hundred yards. But Maliska had never seen real combat before today. The girl's first two shots missed. Stenbeck had fallen onto his own weapon and struggled to bring it round, even as the first of the bugs landed on him. One of its wings sliced through his armor, like it was made out of cobweb. Dietrich opened fire again, shouting Stenbeck's name. She got only one syllable into it when Malinka's third shot hit one of the bugs. The creature exploded into a roiling ball of flame that hit the second one, the one on Stenbeck, and then that bug exploded as well. The blast blew Malinka off her feet as she tumbled into the rising dust and smoke, lost from view in the storm. For a few seconds, Dietrich could only blink and stare at blossoming clouds of fire as the wind carried them away, painting the darkness red and orange and blue. Hudson. Man, what the hell was that? Steny man. Steny. Hudson started toward the burning air, barely seeming to notice the way gusts would ignite above them, a chain reaction that seemed to threaten the possibility of the whole sky lighting on fire. Dietrich grabbed Hudson. Get your shit together. Nothing you can do for him now. Don't you have eyes? Now she had to watch Hudson swivel his head around to stare at the slowly extinguishing fireball and the charred, blackened bones that illuminated all that remained of Stenbeck. Oh man, Hudson said. This is bullshit. Thunder crashed across the sky. They turned to see a fresh fireball streaming toward the ground. Pieces of the bug whipping past them, hitting the dirt like shrapnel. Dietrich glanced around, saw nobody, and knew the only way home was to kill their way out. 
Do your job, Hudson, she said. Light him up. He snapped his head back, then nodded. Killing Bugs was just about the only thing he'd ever been really good at. Back they moved toward the center of the plateau. Bugs whipped overhead like flags and furling. Dietrich took one out with a burst of her plasma rifle, staggered by the blast as it exploded. Hudson shot two. Damn it, Lieutenant, Hicks growled on the comlink. What the hell are these things? Before Polson could reply, a chorus of voices filled Dietrich's head. Above them all, she could hear Zeller and Wierzbowski shouting about the next wave of attacks coming from the cliffs to the northwest. Even as she and Hudson turned in that direction, a gust of wind cleared some of the dust off the plateau, and Dietrich spotted the rest of the unit closing ranks. Malinka limped as she hurried to join them, injured but alive. Gunfire tore through the dust again. A rising crescendo of plasma rifle fire traced its way through the darkness in all directions. Crow and Spunkmeyer had begun to roar, and now Vasquez and Hudson and Wierzbowski joined in. Zeller and Malinka, too. The black kite sliced through the storm, descending. Lieutenant Polson waited, following them with her weapon, and when she opened fire, one of the bugs exploded in a fireball that struck another, and another, destroying four of the deadly kites and turning them into a chain reaction conflagration that swept into the whirl of the storm until the whole sky became a churning tornado of grit and debris and blazing embers. Lieutenant, she shouted, turning to scan for Polson, ready to run to her. They had to retreat, had to get off this godforsaken rock. She didn't see the bug come sailing along the southern edge of the plateau until Zeller started shouting that it was too close, that someone had to kill it. Dietrich turned. Zeller was right. If he'd shot it, the explosion would have torched him and Malinka both. Zeller managed to get his blade out. He fought the thing, stabbing at it, even punctured one of the thing's shielded eyes, but its wings kept slicing at him, tearing at his armor to ribbons, and in seconds, Zeller was on his knees. Dietrich. Zeller. Fall back. Zeller. I can't. My eyes. I think my eyes are bleeding. Gunfire continued. Other voices shouted on the comms. Bugs exploded in the air along with the outer rim of the plateau. The brighter the burning air, the easier it was to spot them, to kill them, before they came closer. Malinka backed away from Zeller's weakening struggle against the thing that had killed him. They were wrapped together, the marine and the glass kite. When Malinka reached her, Dietrich saw the shock in the girl's eyes and knew that no matter how tough she had been in training, she understood combat now. Understood horror. Understood what it meant to be a colonial marine. Finally, Lieutenant Polson had ordered a retreat. Dietrich could hear Apone's familiar growl over the comms, urging them onward. She had lost track of her position, so she could only rely on the others as they hustled back to the dropship, with their withdrawal punctuated by a dozen more explosions that heated the air so much she could barely breathe. Then they were at the dropship. Khan had lowered the ramp and Dietrich stumbled a bit going up. She dropped to the floor inside, surrounded by the others, and as the ramp began to close and she started out at the burning storm, she wondered about the ghosts of Stenbeck and Zeller. The dropship's external guns shot a couple of kites to keep them away from the closing ramp, and then it was over. Vasquez. Anyone want to explain that? How the hell did those things just explode? The whole sky went up in flames. Khan. Just prove the company science team right. Species is carbon-based, like most known life forms. But the solvent for all life on Earth is water. For these aliens, it's propane. Hudson. Oh, that's beautiful. They knew that things were gonna go boom if we shot them, and they sent us out here anyway? Con. They knew there was a chance. Apon. Con. Get us off this fucking rock. Con. Sorry, Sarge. Can't do that. Apone. What the hell are you talking about, Corporal? You want to explain this, Lieutenant? Polson. Corporal Khan, I assume by your reaction that you've gotten readings from the dropship's external instruments. You've located the source of the stabilizing element? Hicks. What the hell is this? Not only did you have intel about the bugs that could have saved Stembeck and Zeller, but now you're saying you and Khan have been keeping this other shit from us too? Polson. You're going to want to stand down, Corporal Hicks. Apone. Stand down, Corporal. Maybe you want to explain yourself. If there were mission parameters you didn't share before, I'd like to hear them now. Polson. We had an additional set of orders. You all know how this works. Every mission has multiple objectives. Objective one was to clear the plateau and pave the way for the next science team to drop a temporary base here. Objective two was to see if the instruments could scan and locate the source of the stabilizing element. Based on information transmitted back by the last group who died here, the company had some theories. Khan. 
That's what I started to say, lieutenants. They're not theories anymore. Dietrich. Spill it already. Khan. The element the company's looking for. The bugs produce it. Dietrich. But now we don't want to kill them. Rysbowski. I don't get it. That's why we're here. To kill them. Vasquez. Not anymore. Dietrich. The job's changed, Wierzbowski. We're not supposed to kill them anymore. Turns out these things are the goddamn prize we came looking for. Now the job is to catch one. The sick expression on Wierzbowski's face reflected the twist in the pit of her stomach. In silence, the rest of the unit exchanged scowls. Malinka grinned, visibly excited at the prospect, and that was when Dietrich knew she wanted to stay far away from the girl. That kind of excitement would make her reckless. The scraping on the hull continued. The bugs were out there waiting, almost as if they knew the dropship wasn't going anywhere. All right, Marines, Sergeant Apone growled as he walked toward the rear of the ship, waiting for Khan to lower the ramp. Let's get it done. Watch each other's backs and try not to die. Vasquez and Hudson high-fived each other, trying to amp themselves up. As Khan hit the controls and the lights started to flash, indicating that the ramp was opening, they all gripped their weapons and watched the gap for those thin fingers, those sharp black glass edges. Air vented out of the ship and the whole unit started forward. As Golden's story ends, the Marines go out once more to face the bugs and we can imagine they went on to successfully hunt those bugs that they were assigned to find. Though, of course, the squad certainly became smaller than it was at the beginning of the mission. It should be noted, though, that Bug Hunt, the collection of these short stories, does come with a disclaimer that these stories may not necessarily be considered canon or within official continuity. But I think it's easy to imagine the Marines from aliens in this situation, or a situation like this, in their past. One of the best things about the Marine characters in Aliens is that their camaraderie feels genuine. That they really have been out there in space on all kinds of missions for some time. Part of this is definitely thanks to James Cameron's writing and directing, but also due to the incredible cast assembled to play our favorite ultimate badasses. Recently, I'm sad to say, we lost one of these cast members. Al Matthews, who played Sergeant A. Pone, passed away September 22nd, 2018, at the age of 75. Matthews, as you may know, was an actual sergeant who served in the Vietnam War. And because of this experience, I think he brought a true authenticity to the role and to the relationship between him and the other Marines. My condolences go out to his friends, family, and fans. We salute you, Sarge. Rest in peace. As always, I'd like to thank you very much for watching today. I really appreciate it, and if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to give a like, and you can also subscribe for all the latest videos from the channel. A very, very special thanks goes out to Wayland Jutani Executives, Emiric, and Lady Anne, part of the Patreon Hive. If you'd like to join the Hive and support the channel, check out my Patreon page for exclusive posts and contests. In the meantime, be sure to catch up with Alien Theory over social media, Follow at Alien underscore Theory on Twitter and at Alien Theory YT on Facebook and Instagram for more. And until next time, this is Alien Theory, signing off.